Hey everyone, Dr. Frunky here with a really exciting new knife consult for you on the Holt Bladeworks Spectre. For those of you who follow me on Instagram, you've been very excited to see this video because I have just acquired a very special version of the Holt Bladeworks Spectre. But for the video, I wanted to have a bit more of an overview of the knife and of Holt Bladeworks as a company overall. Uh, this story is going to go back over a year uh, to Blade Show 2018. At that time, my collection was really just sort of getting into the early stages of custom knife collecting. And the Holt family and the Holt uh, knives were very popular at that time, but they were still sort of an up-and-coming brand. And so I had not gotten on to the hype train. I had not really experienced their knives too much, but I got to experience them at the Blade Show 2018. And I actually just happened to bump into Joe and Angie over at the Chad Nichols table. Chad Nichols makes some uh, of the great materials you might see on some of these fancy high-end knives. Some of this Zerku tie, dark tie, uh, Moku tie and other things like that, but he also makes Moku Mei. At the time, my collection was going through a bit of a Moku Mei experience. This Gareth Bull Shamwari really set the tone for all of that. And so I was there purchasing a piece of Moku Mei, the a piece that actually ended up on my <clears throat> Andre Thorburn L36M, if you recall that from earlier in the year. I struck up a conversation with the Holtz and we got to talking and eventually we landed on building a knife for me. Uh, it just so happened that we were looking at a piece of Mokume and they said that they would somehow integrate that into the knife. Now back then they were making the version 2 of the Spectre. These in front of us are the version 3. The uh, evolution of that discussion actually kind of went along for over a year. So as the Holtz continued to uh, developed the knife, they introduced V3, and then they told me that they were working on a certain special series of bolster-locked uh, Spectres. The Spectre being the main knife that they create. They have a second model coming out soon called the Haptic, but for the past couple of years they've been making this knife, the Spectre. And so they took that piece of Mokume and they were going to make me a bolster lock knife. However, during the process, it felt as if that knife was cursed. Uh, because the first time they tried to make my scales, the power went out. And so that piece of Mokume had to be thrown away, the piece that I actually really liked. Then they had another pattern that wasn't quite as much to my liking. And then as they were making it... Angie accidentally dropped a screwdriver directly onto the Mokume, gouging it, requiring them to refinish it in a way that was not necessarily what I wanted. And so what ended up happening at the Blade Show 2019, just a couple of months ago now, actually just over uh, two months now, I was able to reconnect with Joe and Angie and speak to them sort of about what was going on. Uh, we decided that Mokume may not be the right direction for this knife, and then ultimately I landed on another piece from Chad Nichols because of the significance of meeting them. And so without much further ado, I'm going to introduce the Super Spectre. The Frunky Edition Spectre right here, number 418 with some extremely, extremely special options on it. And we'll get into all of that. But I wanted to bring these knives out here and explain to you the story that I've had behind picking this knife up. Because it's been over a year that I've been waiting to make this video, waiting to show you the knife that came out of all of that work uh, from Joe and Angie. So, uh, let's go ahead and talk about uh, Hold Blade Works. Hold Blade Works is a company out of Iowa that is run by Joe and Angie, and they are American <clears throat> makers who decided that they're going to take up a second career. Both of them have primary careers, and in their spare time, without any formal training, they picked up uh, making pocket knives. This all started back in about 2012. At that time, Joe had made a few fixed blades in the past, but he ended up going to Blade Show around that time, and he became very interested in some folding knives, particularly tactical folding knives, particularly the knives from Shirogorov. A few years later, he went back to Blade Show where that passion was reconfirmed, 
and he decided to start making his own knives. So he bought a CNC machine and the rest was history. The Holt Spectre V1 took the world by storm. It's a very popular knife, CNC machined, high precision, high reproducibility, with a very interesting detent system that captured a lot of people's imaginations. Now, I will say, when the knives first came out, the detent system rather was a bit controversial. Uh, their initial detent system was an integral nub, much like what Brian Nadeau with Sharp by Design was doing. There was a bit of a back and forth, and then uh, as the Holtz developed their knives, they came out with version 2 with an upgraded detent, and eventually they have landed on version 3 now with an even different detent and some modifications here and there. What I wanted to show you was the spectrum of the knives that they offer. They have a grading system in which they, uh, they sort of classify their knives. The lowest level is going to be called utility grade. You're not going to see that here on this table. Utility grade is actually limited to maybe only 10 or 20 knives that they ever made. And they were slab sided with no internal milling and very plain finishes. One step above that is the knives that you're going to see here on the table called the refined series. The refined series have this 3D milling, some nicer finishes on the blade, some internal milling, uh, and things like that. Both of these that you see here fall into the refined series, and they come inside of a, uh, a normal pouch, a lot like this. Uh, this one here came with one of these two. Uh, I wanted to say thank you so much to two of my viewers. Uh, my friend Sid, he goes by Rumble Blades on Instagram, and this came from another one of my viewers. He goes by at Jace's underscore dad on Instagram as well. I wanted to get a couple of variants of this knife on the screen so you guys can see what the variations are that they offer. Hold Blade Works has been through a lot of evolution in terms of how they sell their knives. They've become so popular nowadays that it's rather hard to get a, a hold of one of their knives, a hold of one of their knives, had that joke's been made before, uh, but they used to take custom orders, now they're doing a bit more of a maker's choice sort of a situation. Luckily, I was able to talk to them at a time where they were still making orders. Again, this knife has been in process for well over a year. Uh, before I was able to get it. They're no longer really taking orders anymore. Now they're doing a bit more of a maker's choice lotto sort of system where every Friday they put up a series of knives and they offer them for lottery and folks can pick them up uh, in that way. So find their Facebook group. That seems to be the best way to pick up their knives. And so we've gone over a whole lot of discussion about the knife company. We haven't even talked about the Holt Spectre yet. And so let's go ahead and get into that. We're so many minutes into this video. I hope that you're still following. So let's go ahead and get some vital signs on the Holt Bladeworks Spectre V3. So this knife is coming in at over three and a half inches. You're really looking at about 3.6 inches and that is what they advertise. It is not a three and a half inch knife. It is not gonna fall into those legal categories. And so be aware it's a 3.6 inch blade. You got about 8.1, 8.2 inches of overall length. The handle is coming in at right of four and a half inches with four inches of effective grip area. All of these knives are exactly the same in terms of their overall dimensions. However, they vary very mildly uh, with their blade handle and their internal milling versus uh, some other options and things like that. So let's take a look at uh, how these things stack up on the scale. Uh, this one right here, which has a normal titanium scale with some internal milling, is going to be coming in at 3.5 ounces. This one right here, similar 3D milling, also internal pockets, 3.5 ounces. Now this one right here, with its bolster lock design and some fancy materials on there, is going to be a little bit heavier at 3.87. That has to do with all the zirconium that's on this, and we're going to go ahead and talk about that in just a second. So let's put these knives over here. I want to break these knives down anatomically. I'll show you a quick size comparison real quick. I'm going to bring out a uh, Spider Co. Paramilitary 2. So you can see it's smaller than the Para 2. Uh, and then I'll bring out a Spider Co. Para 3. And you're going to see that it's much bigger than that. So it falls right in between. It's a very nice EDC size. It's slim and small for how long that blade is. At 3.6 inches, uh, the blade is really uh, packed into a very tight package right here. The overall handle width is coming in here at 0.44 inches. So very, very thin on the uh, handle length right there. 
or a handle width right there. So thin, light, and uh, packing a full 3.6 inch blade. If you'll notice the uh, the uh, normal variants right here are actually coming in underneath the golden ratio of one ounce per blade inch, and that's really amazing. 3.5 ounces for 3.6 inches. Quite the accomplishment right there. So let me bring out the plain one, and we can go ahead and break these knives down anatomically. Up front, on these V3s, they're offering these blades in a full flat ground CPM 20 CV steel. Absolutely awesome finishes. Look at the mirror stonewash finish on this blade. You can see my cases. You can see my phone. You can see my lighting solutions over here. Absolutely incredible blade finish on these Spectres. I love the full flat grind. I love the fact that it's 20 CV steel, keeping it in the US of A. You know that it's heat treated well. They send all of their blades out to Peter's Heat Treat and every single blade is individually tested for proper Rockwell hardness. So you know you're getting a quality blade. Uh, it's ground perfectly and then it's sharpened so nicely. They send all of their blades out with a very perfect mirror polished edge and it's incredibly sharp, and they're very consistent with that. The blades are always very well done, uh, <clears throat> and I really have no complaints there. It's a super functional, standard drop point style blade. It looks a lot like a Shirogorov, I'm not gonna lie. It's obvious that Joe's influences were Shirogorov and the user blades, the user folders that he saw uh, at, his, at the blade shows when he was there. Moving back to the pivot, this is running on uh, ball bearings, some ceramic ball bearings inside there. Very smooth action going on here. The real interesting factor here is going to be the detent system. Okay, so now, uh, as it stands, the detent system includes an integral detent nub, but it also includes an adjustable detent system in which there is a uh, CPM 154 uh, sort of, uh, what am I trying to say, cylinder that's stuck within, within the uh, steel insert. And uh, you, they supply you a very tiny little tool. Uh, hopefully I've got it here somewhere and I can actually use it. Uh, maybe I don't have it with me right now in one of these cases. But uh, they supply you with a tiny little Allen key and it allows you to adjust the uh, detent on this. So actually, as you see here, they bring all this stuff out here. All right, here it is. It's the tiniest little Allen key. And uh, here, I'll just do it on mine so I don't affect the other guy's detents. Uh, there's a tiny little spot right there. And if you just drop this in there, you can adjust the detent ever so slightly one way or the other. And uh, what that does is it uh, <clears throat> brings a pin sort of in and out and it allows for the depth of the detent to sit within the blade. So it allows for a different type of snappiness of the detent. And you can adjust that as you see fit. Now, this is different than the system that uh, Brian Nadeau has developed. It's also different than, say, the Hoback rolling detent. So in the Hoback rolling detent system, it's actually the detent ball is moved in and out of the uh, inlay or of the uh, lock bar insert. Rather, this time it's a cylinder that pushes the detent on or off of the blade in terms of the depth. So it's not the detent stays where it is, but it's whether or not it's sitting in the hole deeply or not. Uh, and so that's how they've chosen to adjust their detent. Now, that being said, I'm not really a huge fan of adjustable detent systems. I don't see the purpose in doing that. Uh, I would rather see a perfectly tuned detent from the factory. I say the same thing about the Hoback rolling detent. I really think that you can set a really nice detent and just have it be that because it doesn't really need to change. Uh, and so that's my personal opinion. Uh, I think that this is sort of something that people can perceive as a positive that you have adjustability, but I really don't think that I need that amount of adjustability. It's sort of like selling me a sports car for the road with adjustable suspension. I can tune it if I want to, but I'd rather have it set at sort of a convenient setting and have it always work that way and sort of tuned for the use that it's intended for rather than an adjustable one. But that's my personal preference. Uh, that may not be the most popular opinion, 
But uh, in my in my estimation, making a, a perfectly tuned D10 is more satisfying to me than having an adjustable one. However, I have to appreciate the engineering and ingenuity that went into developing this because I really think that it allows for end user customizability. Uh, and in the initial phases of making these knives, the whole goal was to have a fully customizable knife. Now they've become so popular, it's going to be harder to get these full custom builds. But uh, certainly I understand why they have that. So let's go ahead and move back to the handles. On these refined models, you get these uh, choices of different milling patterns. They have three or four different milling patterns. This one includes some internal pocketing for some lightning. It includes some nice chamfering, including in the flipper tab area. Now, this is something that I wanted to bring up. This is something that I see is some knife makers do when somebody tells them that they should mill out the area around the flipper tab. Okay, so um, there is a reason to do that. It becomes more comfortable to flip the knife. However, uh, in this one, what I've noticed is that your finger actually lands directly on where the uh, handle has been milled right there. So as I flip this knife, my fingers actually land on this transition point right here. And so while it is un not uncomfortable because it has been uh, milled away and it has been rounded, I do not think that the, uh, that the flipper area recess is actually achieving its intended purpose because... It's actually causing me, you know, to feel that, and it's not uncomfortable, but it's rather kind of unpleasant. I would rather it just be smooth right there, or maybe this would extend a little bit farther down here so that as my finger falls here naturally, it actually is sitting within uh, a divoted area right there. So it's a small observation I've had, and it is the same on all of these V3s, and perhaps that will change at some point in the future. Let's go ahead and take a look at Sid's knife here. It's got a wicked frunky green. You know I love the green color. That's why I had to check this one out. So here you can see it's just in plain titanium. No coloration on any parts whatsoever. Uh, Steve Kelly pivot hardware. Uh, hidden hardware pocket clip. Short backspacer. Sort of quarter length backspacer right here. A lot of this is similar on all these builds but once you get into the anodizing that's where you get some really special looks. Angie is the one who's in charge of uh, doing the anodizing and the finishing work. Uh, and so it's really, really nice to see how she's developed her anodizing skills. This is something, these knives are just spectacular sometimes with these colors that she's able to achieve. This is sort of a double finish. There's a green and a bronze going on here. So you see the bronze anno accent pieces, backspacer screws and everything. And then the, uh, the green and bronze look really, really special anodizing skills here. She must have a very nice setup. So let's go ahead and move these guys off the screen because I want to spend a few minutes focusing on my knife. So as I mentioned, I told you the story of how I met the Holtz uh, and how this knife came to fruition. And here we are. Let me go over some of the details here. And when I originally uh, ordered a knife from them, I envisioned getting a rather user spec knife, honestly, because this is how I think the knife is best suited very similar to something like a Shirogorov Neon. It's incredibly nice to have a user finish model of this because it really is a no-nonsense kind of work knife. However, I enjoy challenging makers to use these sort of high-end materials and see what sort of spectacular finishes they can come up with. So as the year progressed, the Holtz said that they had acquired one bar of Damacor steel in the Thor pattern. Uh, and as I was discussing with them, I heard this uh, through some whispers through another guy and I ended up asking them for it and, and this piece came out. Interestingly enough, this blade was intended for Nick Shabazz. Nick Shabazz has a custom order Spectre going through its process right now and he was going to get one of these Damacor blades. He has since re his knife, but when I was at Blade Show 2019, the Holtz were generous enough to offer me the option of keeping the original blade that I had or choosing to pick this one which had belonged to Nick originally and so I did pick this one and so this makes me and Nick knife brothers for life and so that's really cool. Uh, my blade ended up actually on my friend Charlie's knife. Uh, he's in the uh, Knife Life podcast with me if you guys listen to uh, that podcast. So very very cool. The Damacore steel has awesome 
uh, N11X core steel, which is the proprietary Vanax composition as done by the guys over in Sweden at Damasteel. Uh, and of course it has the Thor pattern cladding on it. Absolutely insane. Now, Angie hated Damacore. She really hated making this blade because the Damacore steel, um, I don't actually have a great example of this because my Miura is actually out and I don't have the Scout anymore. But here's the Frank Fisher Fury, also in Damacore. Notice the finishes that are going on here. One did a mirror polish and what Angie did was a hand rub satin. Because what happens with the Damacore, it's actually three steels. The core steel and then the two cladding steels. The cladding steels turn black and silver with the etch, but the core steel turns this matte gray color that Angie did not really like. And so she went with a hand rubbed satin finish that kept all of it shiny, except for the PMC 27, which remains dark etched. And it's an absolutely awesome finish. This is really unique. I don't think I've seen anyone else finish Damacore in a hand rub satin yet, and it's really, really nicely done. Would like to see this finish on a few more uh, blades with this. Very cool. Uh, moving back to the pivot on this one. This was an acquisition at the Blade Show 2019. I went over to Steve Kelly, a tie connector uh, at the Blade Show, and I bought a zirconium pivot screw set and handed it to Joe, and I said, please use this, because they use uh, Steve Kelly or tie connector pivot hardware. Uh, these two knives, you're going to recognize these screws on lots of other knives because they are standardized screws sold by Tie Connector, the company. And so since I knew that that would be compatible, I found some zirconium hardware, which I thought would be really awesome given the zirconium found in the dark tie material right here. So what I was able to do is actually take the blade that they intended to use, this exact blade. I walked back over to the Chad Nichols table with my good buddy Russ. He goes by That's Not a Knife on Instagram. And we looked at all the billets of uh, fancy materials that were sitting on the Chad Nichols booth. And this pattern, Dark Tie, seemed to have the most similar swirly pattern to the Thor Damacor. And so I picked it out and uh, they ended up purchasing that. The Holtz purchased it and then used it for this knife. So not only is there Dark Tie scales on the front, or scale on the front but also the back and then they were also able to use the dark tie to create a 3d milled hidden hardware pocket clip which is really the icing on the cake i didn't think that they were going to be able to do that with the piece that i had gotten them but they really pulled it off and it is incredible add to that they added a zirconium backspacer on this really the materials here are just incredible and they've done an, an amazing job of executing this knife now, when I got this knife, I have to be completely honest with you. There was a bit of a problem. And uh, the Holtz have addressed it, but I need to be straightforward uh, because I need to just raise awareness that this may be something that you see. When I got the knife, when I disengaged the lock, uh, I checked for blade play. Uh, when I first got the knife, there was a tiny amount of blade play. Uh, and so I tried to tighten the pivot down and it didn't go away. Uh, it turns out that with the blades made of Damacore, the Holtz had, for whatever reason, milled all of the holes slightly too big. Uh, and so there was no way that I was going to be able to tighten the pivot to get the blade play out because it was actually a fit issue with the pivot stop pin and the holes drilled in the blade. So I sent it back to the Holtz and they figured this out and the solution that they came up with was actually pretty incredible. Joe actually milled on his uh, machine a new pivot cylinder on the inside. So he actually made me a slightly larger pivot cylinder uh, and it took the blade play right out. So it's incredible. This actually has an in-house made pivot cylinder uh, that is perhaps unique among all Holtz at this stage of the game. And so that's another very neat feature about this particular knife right here. And I'm really thankful that the Holtz are able to sort of troubleshoot and figure out solutions like that. It gives me a lot of faith that if you have a knife that has any kind of a problem, they're going to figure out an elegant solution for you. 
uh, and I'm not sure that many other blades have any blade play. This one right here has none. It's absolutely perfectly, perfectly tuned. This one is Loctited in a position where it has just the tiniest bit of wiggle that might be able to be uh, tightened out. Uh, something else that I noticed, they use Loctite or Vibratite from the factory or from their bench. And, you know, I, I don't know if you really need to do that. I can do that on my own if I really need to. I really don't like it when knives come Loctite already. That's another issue of mine. However, what do I think of the whole Bladework Spectre? I've been rambling for 25 minutes. It's unlikely that any of you are still listening. But if you are, I think this knife is pretty great. I would really try to get in at the lower level of the knife. The base price is $700 nowadays. $700 will get you this knife. I think it'll get you a basic sort of anodization. This might be a little bit more expensive with all the anno that it has. This one right here, basically, if you just add all the materials costs, you're going to get to the price of this knife, which was somewhere around $2,000. But they're not charging me more then it's basically a $700 knife plus the materials. So they're not really gouging me in any way. This is how much the knife costs because of the materials. This is like a $500 blade and a $500 piece of scale, $700 piece of scale material uh, and a $50 pivot. So I just it just costs that much money in addition to the $700 that it already costs. So they are fairly reasonably priced within the market segment today. Uh, at least on the primary market. On the secondary market, these things are shooting through the roof because they are so desirable. Now, what makes these knives so desirable? What is it about the Holt Spectre that makes it so awesome? Well, I think that this knife, very much like the Grimsmo Norseman and Rask and the Koenig Knives Arius, neither of which I have to show you, unfortunately, right now, represent the absolute epitome of CNC knife making perfection. The action on these knives is stupendous. The tolerances across these knives are perfect. Everything is centered. Everything looks great. Take a look at the machining going on here. Crisp, clean lines. Machining is on point. Everything looks great. The knife is utilitarian in nature. It has an extremely functional blade. Extremely nicely finished. Peter's heat treat. Just an incredible... Put, incredibly put together knife and in the spectrum of knives that are offered today it is a pretty fair price if you're looking at a knife like a Chris Reeves Sabenza Chris Reeves Sabenza is going to run you somewhere around 400 to 500 to 700 dollars depending on the spec so if you're saying it's a 425 dollar knife base this one is 700 dollars you're looking at a little bit more uh, fancy sort of milling you're looking at a higher end steel, you're looking at ball bearings, you're looking at a lock insert, you're looking at hidden hardware. So I think that it's a fair price in the spectrum of knives being offered today, especially considering it's being made by two people effectively out of their home basement. Uh, and so that's the really special thing about these knives is the people behind them. So not only are they extremely functional tools, they're made by two of the nicest people I've ever met. You know, uh, the really special thing about meeting Joe and Angie is that they are sort of uh, contagious in terms of their enthusiasm for knives and their positivity. Uh, really, Angie is just bubbling with energy at all times, and Joe is sort of always looking serious but also enjoying the moment. He's like processing how he's going to do the next thing really well. And so it's an awesome dynamic to see and that's what makes these knives all the more special is not only are they well made really nice looking and just cool but they're also made by a couple of people that you can't help but love they're very kind they've been on my podcast once or twice already uh you just really it's so much fun to talk to them they're very available they really do a very good job with their social media and interacting with people and so it makes it easy to love these knives uh, because not only are they good, but the people are good. So you have a good feeling in your heart when you own these things, like you're supporting good people. So I've been rambling now for 30 minutes, but that's because these knives are very special. There is a reason that there is so much hype around them. 
two of the nicest people I've ever met in the knife industry are working diligently in their basement to turn out these amazing knives. And they can make anything from a very basic plain user to an absolute spectacular world-class piece that is on par with any of the crazy custom knives from any makers on the market right now. Uh, a lot of people are going to argue that CNC knives are not custom knives, but when you see that it's Joe and Angie in a basement putting all this together, working in their off hours just for the passion of it all, you see why these knives are so special and why the secondary market is exploding on them right now. So I know that a lot of you have whole blade work specters. Leave some comments down below about what you think of these knives. Go ahead and check out their website, wholebladeworks.com for a lot more information. Tons of videos out there on YouTube about these knives, but I thought I'd throw my hat into the ring and show off my extremely special build. Uh, so thank you to Joe and Angie for being very patient with me over the course of an entire calendar year. Uh, through all the snafus and all of the problems that we had uh, and how you guys fixed it, it just speaks volumes about how amazing you are as people and as knife makers. So I wish you all the success. I'm looking forward to the new model called the Haptic, which is a smaller Warncliffe style blade. Take a look at that one that's up and coming. Thank you guys for watching this video. Go ahead and click like and subscribe to my YouTube channel here. Head over to Instagram and follow me as Dr. Frunky. And as always, guys, take care.